You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rich, Rish, there you go. take two. And now here's your hosts, Rich Ank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll get it done. And now here's your hosts, Rich Ank. I keep wanting to say the last thing. Yeah, no, here we go. And now here's your hosts, Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich. Whoa, I think announcer man got uh, into the uh, champagne a little early. Good evening. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 1, page 195. Wow, we got giant size Dune Steve this month. That's right. This is uh, our last story of the summer issue. That's why uh, old announcer man dipped into the champagne a little early. Uh, We've got some standing by for when we finish our final show of the big inaugural issue. Starting next month, we've got the fall issue of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. One more show, and then, then you can celebrate. This is one of your hosts, Rish Outfield. And this is another one of your hosts, Big Anklevich. And here's your final host, R-O-8-O-T. <laughs> Wait, he's he gets to be a host now? We didn't. When did he get a promotion? I thought he just checked the emails. I, you know, I had to renegotiate his contract. He, he beeped so many times on last week's show that basically I just had to give it to him because it was either that or pay him more. So I, we're just calling him a host. All right. Just to, just... okay. Well, welcome to the family, O Eight O T. Glad to have you uh, with us. Was was that good? A good thing he just said. He was talking to you. Of course it wasn't. <laughs> Anyways, this week's story is Into Silence Like a Shout by Pete Tuzinski. Peter Tuzinski is a resident of Minnesota for no readily apparent reason. He writes a lot, drinks far too much tea, and does not sleep nearly enough. He has been assured by those of us at Dunstief that following the conclusion of this broadcast, his children and domestic animals will return to him safely from an undisclosed location. Furthermore, he is writing this of his own free will. There is no one in the household named Knucklebones Henry, and he has made no attempt to contact the police. Into Silence Like a Shout by Pete Tuzinski And so it came to pass that in the twelfth year of the third age of Midard, the wise men and scryers who lived in the great kingdom of Het did come unto the golden palaces and seek audience with the king. They came from all corners and through all passages of the kingdom. None of them had spoken with the others. They each of them watched the skies and felt the earth and peered into silver bowls filled with blackest ink and troubled by what they saw they each decided to ride to the palaces king aranath saw them each in turn as they arrived and he listened they all shivered before him for he was a great and powerful presence he was the barbarian king who had overthrown the troll regime in the south and who had owned the love of an immortal elf maiden and he was quickest with a sword, and surest with a bow, and swiftest on a horse. They spoke anyway. Aranath listened to them as they arrived individually. Occasionally, when they happened to show up at the same time, he would listen to them together. Inevitably, the astrologers argued with the scryers, argued with the windwalkers, but though they argued about methods and interpretations, they all grimly agreed on the final verdict. The world was coming to an end. It's the pull of the Pale Mother, was what they all tended to say. The Pale Mother was Midard's moon, soft and clear, 
hanging in the nighttime sky. Something has happened to her, and she has fallen out of her path. She spins wildly now, and soon Middard's pull will bring her down into our world. It will destroy us. Aranath listened, and the wise men quivered in fear. There was no need, however, for he was a just and righteous king. He thanked them all gravely, and much to their collective surprise, he believed what they had to say. Aranath kept no scryers or astrologers in the palace, but he did keep men who lived in worlds of numbers, and who understood that the lights in the nighttime skies were other suns, and that there were forces and powers in the world that were not magic. These were men of cold science, and they had just said the same thing as the scryers. What can we do about it? Aranath asked his scientists. Nothing, they said. We can try to move underground. Will that save us? No. And so Aranath grudgingly consulted the wizards. Can magic help us? Aranath asked. Opidius, Lord Wizard of the Red, only shook his great bearded head. He'd been in the king's great throne room only a handful of times since Aranath had revealed himself and returned from exile to rule. This time, for the first time, Opidius looked small and old, dwarfed by the great room around him, by the towering ornate statues of legendary kings of yore. The greatest of magics can only influence the things of the earth, Opidius said. Pale Mother looks down on Midard, but she is not a part of Midard. And unfortunately, by the time she is, she will have already crashed into us, and there will be nothing left for us to do. Opidius looked out one of the tall balconies and down on the kingdom, laid out before the palace, which was built into the side of a steep mountain. Pale mother shone over the land on this cloudless night, bright and huge in the nighttime sky. And was it larger than it had been on previous nights? Aranath wondered. So it ends, Opidius said quietly. I take my leave of you now, king. And where will the Lord of the Red go? Aranath asked, seated on his great stone throne. Opidius considered and said, my brothers and I can leave this world, but we are forever tied to it. It's the curse of magic. When Midar dies, then the magic dies, and then we die. So leaving is of no use. Aranath asked again. So where will you go? Opidius looked at him. Home, he said. I will go home, and I will drink a good wine. I will rest, and I will think, and I will wait. Farewell, O king. When the wizard lord of the red had left the room, Aranath sat slumped, a great hulk of a figure across an ornate seat made of granite, his head resting on one rough hand. His long black hair fell about his face, and he didn't care. By the time Opidius had left the city of Het behind and was riding out across the great plains, Aranath was still slumped and in thought. At length, the king stood up and walked out of the great throne room. The throne room was dark, since it was the middle of the night, and he was in no mood to receive anyone in grandeur. He walked through the great corridors of his palace, treading silent with the skill of a hunter, something he'd spent long years being during his time in the south. His silk robes whispered on the stone and against his skin. All was silent as he walked, and when his servant came to walk beside him, even his lithe footsteps were silent. He was named Norris, and he had been in the king's possession for nearly eight years since Aranath had first beaten Norris's people and brought them under an iron rule. What are your wishes, O king? said Norris as they walked. Norris had two blue lines painted across his forehead, 
long since faded almost to nothing. They were the markings of his tribe. Aranath had forbidden him to repaint them fresh, but Norris had been careful never to wash the paint entirely off. Aranath looked at the tall bronze statues of ancient heroes as he passed them. The god-king, Niphetus, who had come back from the dead through clever use of magic in time to stop the murder of his son. The chosen Samuel, a poor farmer with a mind like a silver fish in a clear brook. So clever and noble. How much did you hear? Aranath asked. I would not presume to listen to the barbarian king's counsels, Norris said. Aranath didn't believe it, and Norris knew it. Still, the king didn't press. He was about to dismiss Norris for the evening, then changed his mind. Gather together my traveling garments and my sword, then go to my stables and see to it my steed is made ready. Norris didn't question his master. He nodded and replied, You'll be leaving in the morning, my lord. No, Aranath said. I'll be leaving right away. There is no time. Glad of War was a great and powerful steed, white as fresh snow and dangerous as a mad dog. No man could tame or ride him without being thrown off and trampled to death. Thus, it had been to the great astonishment of everyone in the South when a simple hunter with long black hair had commanded that the doors of the stable be barred and everyone should wait outside. There had been twenty minutes of loud noise from inside and the walls had shaken with the thunder of the horse's hooves. Then, the gates had opened and Aranath had ridden out, bareback, atop the great white steed. Now Aranath rode through the great gates of the city of Het, and out onto the long, barley plains that laid on either side of the road. Glad of War rode hard and angrily and even at night, when the whole world seemed ethereal and dim in the pale moonlight. He chased the stars and tried to bite the horizon. Aranath rode through the chilly nighttime air, and he grew wet with the dew as they stormed across the land. He wore leather armor, so old and well used that it felt like cloth to the touch. He wore a heavy brown cloak with the cowl pulled up. Strapped to the saddle was his great sword, the legendary soul blade with a great eye in the hilt where the blade and handle came together. It was closed, asleep and inert to the world. The sun came up, sharp and brilliant as it illuminated the world that sprawled beneath it. Aranath rode through small villages and across rushing rivers. He passed a gnome tribe, moving slowly along the side of the road in little wagons pulled by turtles. He passed a great troll, pulling tree stumps out of a field for reasons all its own. The sun climbed still higher and he rode still onward. Even at its brightest, the sun could not completely hide the full moon that hung in the sky. Aranath did not look at it. Looming up and out of the bright sunlit lands, marring them like a wound, was a long stone wall that circled a great black tower. Shortly after noon, Aranath reached the wall, and he reigned Gladivore in. The great gates of Rigaden were taller than a dozen men and thicker than a house. They were opened by trolls harnessed to a mill wheel. They had never been breached. Not in all the wars between the kingdom of Het and the tower of Derringer. Today, the gate stood ajar, like the door of a house that the breeze has drifted open. The black guards who normally patrolled the tops of the great walls were gone. The mill wheels just inside the gates were empty. So were the great barren fields and courtyards before the tower. No one questioned Aranath's presence. Indeed, it didn't seem as if there was anyone there to notice it. He rode across the path, dust rising up behind him. The morning dew never seemed to settle in here, nor did a spring rain or a winter's snow. Here it was hot, and it was dry, and it always stunk of the acrid smoke of great machines. 
As he approached the tower, the obsidian gates creaked open, just a little, and a gaunt man in a white robe came out. He supported himself with a tall wooden staff, and he had a long beard that had yellowed around the mouth. His hair was even longer than his beard and far whiter. When he spoke, his voice was deep and sonorous. You show the greatest of arrogance, barbarian king, to ride alone into the stronghold of Rigadon, to come into the very heart of my place of power. Perhaps the corruption of your rule has reached your mind and caused you to think. Your armies have gone, Aranath said as he slid off his horse. Glad of war stood and waited, breathing a little heavily. Your servants have left you. The wizard lord of Rigadon, Derringer, drew himself up and looked down a long hooked nose at Aranath. His grip on his staff tightened. Aranath added, They've probably gone home, haven't they, to say goodbye? Derringer sighed, and he relaxed his grip. He nodded. When first my servants told me that the world was ending, that the moon was coming down, I thought it a trick by you to frighten my men. But I have my own methods, my own skills, and I soon confirmed what they had told me. Even you cannot trick the Pale Mother herself into coming down out of the sky. Even you wouldn't. Neither would you, Aranath said. When last we met, we fought so fiercely that the Harpy Glades were burned to ash and have never grown again, Derringer said. What do you want this time? Aranath reached into his saddlebag and pulled out a tall bottle of fine liquor, and he held it up. The sunlight glittered off the dark green glass, which made the golden liquid inside look almost black. I came to drink, Aranath said. And to talk. Derringer looked down at him silently for a long moment, then gestured toward the doorway that led into the tower. Aranath followed him up the stairs and inside, where the black walls were illuminated by thick candles in heavy iron holders. Every sound they made echoed as they walked, the place as silent and still as a crypt. They settled into great chairs, high up in the tower, in front of tall windows that looked out over all the land. From here... You could faintly make out the mountain city of Het. When the sun is just right, Derringer said as he offered two metal cups to the king who filled them with liquor, I can see the light glittering off your palace. From my towers I can see this place on a clear day. Aranath handed the drink back. I could always tell when you were on the move. The black columns of smoke rose up from your machines as you readied your men for war. The machines stand still now. So much metal just rusting beneath the ground. Derringer replied. Some of my men deserted. I sent others out to catch them and bring them back to be punished. But those men didn't return. When the rest began to leave, I did nothing to stop them. On the way out, someone unchained the trolls. They drank for a moment in silence. I have spoken with my magicians and wizards, Aranath said. There's nothing they can do. The moon will come down. They suggest hiding underground, but that's a dubious hope. It's no hope at all, Derringer said. They drained their cups, and Aranath refilled them. I never wanted the world destroyed, Derringer said. I wanted you dead, and I wanted power, and I wanted to rule, but what good are any of those things if the world itself is shattered? We were friends once, Aranath said. Before you fell, and before you rose. Aranath nodded. He finished. 
We fought for fifteen years. It means nothing now. As they drank, Aranath looked around the room. To one side was a great oaken table, and across it were massive sheets of paper, all of the available space on them covered in sketches and scribbles and numbers. Derringer followed his gaze. When first they told me, I began to lay plans for great devices to prevent the disaster. Derringer said. Or to save lives. Such a strange new thing to think about. But important, no less. I conceived the greatest trebuchet ever built that would hurl stones as the moon fell and deflect it. But it wasn't big enough. Or strong enough. It wouldn't have worked. It's maddening, Aranath said. I've defeated death and stared down the shambling army. I've faced you many times. I've won the soul blade. I even bested a volcano. And yet, and yet, when the world's time comes, there is nothing to be done. The bards sing of me as the greatest hero Het has ever known. But in the end, I am no more than a man. Derringer nodded. Then he held up his cup and said, This is fine wine. Two thousand years old, it is fine wine. Come. Derringer stood up, and Aranath noted that he did it a bit slowly, very much like an old man. Derringer took his long staff and leaned against it, then gestured into the cavernous expanses of his tower. Let me show you this place I have built. We may have fought over its purpose, but it's beautiful no less. They walked together, mostly in silence, through the tallest places of the Tower of Derringer, and into the lowest caverns where the mighty machines were kept. The great wheels and cogs were motionless. The roaring fires reduced to smoldering embers. The smoke and oppressive heat had given way to gentle coolness, Aranath looked around and studied the details that Derringer pointed out to him. And it was beautiful, really. It was a world unknown to him, a world of wheel and lever and automaton. When they emerged into the dusty courtyard in front of the tower, where Glad of War trotted aimlessly and grazed on the dead grass that was scattered about them, both men looked toward the sky, where the moon was plainly visible. It did seem bigger now, and not just a trick of the mind. Aranath whistled to Glad of War, who trotted toward him. Then he turned toward Derringer and said, Come with me to the Golden Palace. You've shown me your home, and it is beautiful and strange and powerful. Now let me show you mine, which is old and heavy with history. I've been there before, Derringer said. Many years ago, no barbarian king, your halls would have nothing for me but memory and sorrow. And I'm old and tired. I don't wish to travel so far as that. Go back to your halls and I'll stay here and rest. Aranath held out a hand big and rough from years of hard work and fighting, and Derringer shook it with his own hand long and gaunt and pale. They stood in silence for a long moment. Then Derringer glanced up at the moon again and said, Go in good faith. The kingdom of Het and the Tower of Derringer stand as friends for this little while. Aranath smiled and mounted glad of war. He nudged his horse around and then... Without a look back, they moved into a gallop and left the tall black tower behind. Through the gate and then Glad of War chased the horizon. Aranath stopped only once on the ride home, at the shores of a deep, dark lake. He cantered Glad of War to the water's cold edge and without dismounting, unsheathed the soul blade. It was a massive sword, but weighed no more than a small knife. 
The great eye was open now and stared at him, full of a singular hatred that showed in every glance. That was the sword's power, after all. It hated you, and that hatred coursed through every inch of the magical steel like fire. He met the furious gaze for a long moment and then said, Good night. Then he arched his arm and hurled the blade as far out over the water as he could. It sliced through the water as easily as it would have cut through flesh and bone, and with only the faintest of ripples, it sunk to the black depths. The lake was unbelievably deep, and only grew colder and darker the further down you went. There were ghosts in those depths. Those who had come to stay, and those you brought with you when you dove. It was here where Aranath had first gotten the sword. Then, the blade gone, he rode back to the city of Het in silence. There was no sound except Glad of War's hoofbeats as they reached the palace. Het was not deserted. There were people about, none of whom looked at Aranath. They were all doing their own things, and he left them to it. The palace, though, was all but deserted. He strode through the great doors and into the halls where, dwarfed by statues of heroes past, Nora sat on a bench. They've all gone, Nora said. He didn't bother to stand. Aranath stood in front of him, towering over the skinny man. They've all heard about the Pale Mother, and they've all gone to their homes. Some of them stole from you, though I don't know what they intend to do with the gold. Die with it, Aranath said. Norris looked up at him for the first time, and there was a tremulous bravery in his eyes and on his face. He stood up, still smaller than the great king, and said, In the south, my people have risen up from their captivity and declared their freedom once more. We are a tribe again. Aranath noted that Norris had repainted the blue lines on his face, brilliant against dark skin. And will your tribe declare war against Het again? Aranath asked softly. No, Norris said. We'll go away and we'll be left alone, and I will go with them. The last was said in a defiant rush, and the fear was evident in his eyes. Aranath nodded. He said, Then go. Good night, Norris. And then, without another word, Aranath turned and walked deeper into his empty palace. He bypassed the great throne room, the halls of heroes, the endless library. He went to the small set of rooms that were his own. Once there, he stripped off his tunic and sat, bare-chested on the edge of his little bed. He stared out the window, at a bright sky and the big moon, bigger than the sun and just as bright from all the reflected light. He did not move again. Pale Mother collided, the world cracked, and it was broken. The magic of the world bled out, as if from an open wound, and it was gone. The violence of the moon's crash was impossible to imagine, and seemingly unending. But it did end, eventually. The world settled years later. Although it was nothing like the world that had once been, eventually the smothering dust cloud did settle again, and same as it had ever done, the sun rose in the east and set in the west. It illuminated the barren world, though there were none to see it doing so. And thus it was that after twelve years of the third age of men, the world of Middard did meet its end. Author's Note When the short story you just heard was finished and I showed it to some people, one of the comments I got was that it felt like um, the closing chapters of a much longer story. It felt like it should have been a novel. 
and it was never intended to be. But I think the reason it feels that way is that it is harvesting, um, rather shamelessly, the characters and the settings and the worlds of all the fantasy. All the Lord of the Rings, the Conan the Barbarian, Robert Jordan stuff, even the video games. It's all in there, and it's saying all of these things matter, even though they're cliches. And they can be put into a new and unique situation and made sharp and good and cool. And I don't know if I succeeded or not, but that was what I was setting out to do, and I hope you enjoyed it. Okay, welcome back. Hope you guys enjoyed that story. Thank you for submitting that, Peter. And thank you for listening, Mr. John Smith of 223 Crescent Circle. Yeah, I wouldn't want to offend our one listener. As always, if you have a story that you'd like to send our way, we have a little email box that you can drop that into at submissions at doonsteef.com. Take a look at our submission guidelines. They're readily available right on our website. And send us that gem of literary fiction that you've been saving for just this perfect moment. We'll read it and then throw it in the trash, light it on fire, and pee on it. And if you have a comment or a suggestion or a hate letter of the week, you can give our new host, R-O-A-D-O-T, uh, something to do by sending an email to editor at com. Now comes our favorite moment of every week when we, well, the dread moment of every week, where we beg on bended knee for someone to please donate. <laughs> Would you like to ask for donations? No. I, 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 okay, that's, that's what, the, the youngest member of the host team is the one that has to beg for donations. And it's make-believe robot language. What do you think of that? Uh, and Big, what what, uh, what did he just say? Well, it was a really good plea for donations. Um, inspired. I think maybe we'll have him do it again next week. Well, all right. I'm glad you hired him. Uh, I, I'm not really, but I'm a little gladder than I normally am. So anyhow, this is our last show of the very first issue of the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. It was our summer issue. We started in July. Here we are at the very end of September. Next month, October kicks off the fall issue, and uh, we thought we'd just do a very truncated show and just talk about the state of the podcast, what our idea was when we first started this, how we think it's going, and where it's going in the future. So uh, a few months ago, we started out with the idea of uh, putting together a story-related podcast. We kind of had uh, two somewhat different ideas. I thought it would be really cool to do a, a story podcast where we read stories. Rish wanted to be a radio DJ morning uh, show announcer type guy. So we kind of combined those. We do a story, and then we do our own little show at the end and most people skip that part but that's okay because uh there's only one listener anyways so you can only get rejected once it's not so bad but anyways i think we you know we started out just wanting to be able to bring some really good stories to to people to be able to listen to and when we first started and we put our name out there and we were hoping to get some submissions i really had no idea what to expect and i was hoping and praying that we would get some stories that would be worth doing. And all of a sudden, the stories, you know, they just poured in. And I personally have really enjoyed all the stories that we've put out during this uh, short period of time. And um, I'm really proud of how our first issue has come off and what we were able to accomplish. And I'm excited looking into the future as to what we're going to do. We've already accepted several stories for our upcoming issue. And some of them are, are, are really great. Uh, there's a nice mix of horror and uh, stuff that's not horror. Because, you know, if I had my way, it would be all horror all the time. Uh, we've got a great lineup of stories for next issue. And I'm excited. A couple of them are not horror. And I'm still excited. So that shows how good those tales are. So yeah, I'm, I'm also really excited about the stories we've got coming up. We've got a few from some returning writers, some writers that uh, we enjoyed their stories in the past, and they submitted another story to us. And it turns out they were, uh, again, really good stories. And so we've gone ahead and accepted 
their stories a second time around. We've got some other stories from some first-time writers. And we've got some uh, interesting things that we're planning on doing, I think, with this uh, upcoming issue. October is coming, and of course, October means Halloween. October means, you know, it means horror story time. So we're going we're gonna to bring you several horror stories in the ne- upcoming month. And we're excited about that. We, we have already, I guess you could say we've already started a little bit because aside from today, our last two episodes were both, they were horror stories, a story about a ghost and a story about a creepy old lady that steals your soul and your, I don't know what she steals, or your life and whatever. And we'll be back later for the rest of you. So uh, now uh, we're moving into some more scary stories coming up. I absolutely hate winter, and I hate the, the I hate fall too because it always meant the summer was over and I had to go back to school. But the month of October though was the one bright spot for fall for in for me, and for about the last ten years, my buddy Tyrannist and I have had a oh, we've had a tradition where. We do an October scary story event every year where uh, starting at the first day of October, we make the deal to write a scary story and swap it the last day of October. And uh, I've been telling Big Anklevich about this for years. And he thought, well, why don't we do something like that for the Doonstief as well? Yeah, I was saying, why don't we invite all of our listener to... uh to go ahead and and join in on this uh, scary story event. So you just write a scary story and you have to, what's the deal? Tell, tell me how the deal of it works. Oh, it was always just, you couldn't start it before October. It, maybe it was, an, it was an idea you had had for years, but you couldn't start writing it till October came on the calendar. And then it had to be done by Halloween. So the rule is, if you want to uh, join in in the October scary story event... Uh, you must write a scary story, and you have to write it within the month of October. So you have until October 31st at midnight to finish this story. And then we invite you all to submit it to us, and the, the best story from this will win the contest and will be done as a uh, episode of The Doonstief. And the winner will get the severed head of R08OT. What do you think of that, robot? <laughs> Rish, uh, is that is that your older sister or your younger sister that he's talking about here? I, I only have younger s- Wait, wait, what did he say? Uh, nothing. Uh, so anyways, um, so we open that up to everybody. I'll put a post on the blog about it to give a little bit of info, and I, I'll try and include it also into the submission guidelines. When you send your story to us, just uh, be sure to note somewhere that this is for the October Scary Story event. And uh, yeah, the best story from all the ones that we receive, we'll, we'll get an episode. And if we don't receive any, well, then we'll just move on. Um, and since that's more likely, uh, we'll see. So that's October. Then we've got November. November will probably just go back to regular stories. Then comes December. And we were thinking, well, why not ask people to submit Christmas stories as well? Yeah, uh, we, we wanted the, some Christmas stories if... You have one. I mean, I, I I know that Christmas genre is kind of difficult to include into another genre like horror or uh, sci-fi or fantasy. But you know, if if the if you know someone that has a good Christmas fantasy sci-fi horror story, uh, go ahead and have them send it our way, and we'd love to try and get something holiday related. Um, at the very beginning of this, I mentioned that this was a giant-sized first issue because I, I'm not sure that we can <laughs> that we can keep up the pace of the first issue, especially what we did the first couple of weeks. We we were putting out a podcast every single week, and uh, like I said before, it is pretty much just the three of us because I'm not going to count the robot. It's me, you, and announcer man. How how you doing over there, announcer man? <laughs> Well, he has become as hard to understand as the robot. It is just the two of us basically doing all of the work. So I'm thinking that our second issue might be a little shorter than the first. Well, you know, I've kind of noticed over the last uh, few episodes that we've kind of settled into a rhythm, kind of uh, gotten to where we want to be with it, it seems. Uh, You're right. In the early uh, shows, we were going once a week. And uh, 
originally I thought that's what we would do. We would try for once a week. Um, my bank account uh, wasn't really handling it so well. And also, my life wasn't handling it so well. I found that was just too much. Um, and that was one thing that I just, you know, I worried about that from the beginning. I really wanted to do a podcast, but I didn't want to let it take over my life. I wanted to still be able to have a life and just have this as a hobby. And so, you know, recently it seems like we do a story about every 10 days or so. So you get like three stories a month that way. And it seems like that's a good good way to go. And, you know, we'll have goals that we'll shoot for and whether we make it and within those goals or not, who knows. But, you know, if we're going to be late, we're just going to be late and I'm not going to let it again. I'm not going to let it take over my life. And since Rish has no life, it won't take over his... Cue that tremendously happy music, o t Thank you. I'm so very alone. Just, just someone hug me. I, I'm not the elephant man on the inside. Be careful. I think an uh, announcer man may come out of his booth and slap you a sloppy wet kiss while he's at it. Yeah, I think he's really had a few. Um, anyways... <laughs> So uh, one thing we wanted to do as we close out our summer issue is we wanted to thank everybody who's helped us out through uh, this whole time. Obviously, uh, you hopefully have noticed that a few of the voices that we've had read these stories aren't either Rish or I doing these voices. We've gotten other people to, to pitch in and to lend their talents, and we'd really like to say thanks. And... Uh, I guess uh, we also wanted to let announcer man, you want to say something? Yes, come on out here and say something. Come on out of the booth and, and say something. Go ahead. It's time for the hate letter of the week. Uh, oh, really? Is that, that's why you got, we give you the chance to say, you say that every week. It's time for the hate mail of the week. All right. Well, who reads, me or you? All right. Uh, here we go. Dear Big Ankolovich and Rish. They misspelled your name. Babe. I discovered your podcast recently when it was brought up by a search engine I will never use again. And I was surprised when I saw the name Dunstief on your site. You see, I am a professor of European history, and I am knowledgeable of Dunstief, the Scandinavian barbarian and conqueror from the mid-8th century. Dunstief the drooling was a soldier and sailor prince, nearly forgotten to history today. He is known for terrorizing the Caspian Sea and laying waste to the coasts of Norway six different times and was much feared for his tremendous appetite for the heads of small children, among which numbered his own. He was garroted by his own grandmother in 760 AD and, according to the scant extant records, took 11 days to die. I, I was delighted that you would be familiar with this ancient figure, figure <laughs> and felt... I had found a kindred spirit, since lately none of my friends will talk to me. However, listening to your podcast, I heard no mention of Fenoscandia or even any knowledge of historical Europe. Furthermore, the two of you seem to have a basic ignorance of all things cultural and educational, leave alone anthropological. Is that right? Is that a word? I fear that if you read this letter on the air, it will be relegated to your silly weekly hate letter section, and that is unfortunate. Not that I don't hate you. Indeed, I do. Especially Rish, who I hope dies of something messy and highly contagious. But I thought this email would do many listeners a service and shine a little enlightenment in their benighted lives. Yours disappointedly... Dr. Lewis N. Skolnick, Ph.D. Okay, hold on. I've got to take umbrage with this email. I hate it when people make blind, false generalizations about us. And you couldn't be more wrong, Mr. Skolnick. We don't have many listeners. Who feels dumb now? Thanks for the letter there. Um, Big, did you, did you know about this, this Scandinavia barbarian thing when, when the, that had the name Steve? Yeah. So uh, moving on, uh, we'd just like to thank everybody for listening this week. It's a great day to be able to finish off our uh, first issue. We're really excited about moving into volume one, number two, page one, next time. So I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield, reminding you that my father was no devil worshiper. And I'll have words with any man who says otherwise.
Good night, folks. Good night. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or charge the file. You want four. Okay, yeah, and I was thinking of charge. Okay. Uh, take two. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. There are no dwarf women. Take two. Indy, my friend, I'm so glad you're not dead. What can we do about it? Nothing. <laughs> you gotta slobber a lot, right? Huh. There are no dwarf women. Oh, it sucks, but whatever. I'm done with that guy. There are no dwarf women. Gather together, my traveling... Now, sir, now I'm Christopher Lee. There are no dwarf women. You're coming like the hardest story we've done. Is that all right? There are no dwarf women. There are no dwarf women. Damn. <laughs> to come into the very heart of my place of power. No, that's... Your armies have gone. There are no dwarf women. No. Your servants have left you. Dwarves are not to the sprinters. There are no dwarf women. There are no dwarf women. There are no dwarf women. There are no... Neither would you. There are no... There are no... There are no dwarf... There are no... It's the pull of the pale mother. Mother.